I want to welcome you to what we hope is the first joint forestry fisheries webinar on resilient rivers counting fish from forests. I want to begin with two technical points. First, your program is being simultaneously translated in Spanish and in English. So to select your preferred language, use the small globe icon to the bottom right of your Zoom screen. We're asked to let you know that if the audio, audio quality deteriorates, as can happen in a remote environment, interpretation will be impossible for a brief moment. The interpreters will let you know and they will resume interpretation as soon as the sound quality permits. Due to the large turnout, we're not including a Q&A session, but we're really encouraging all our participants to make comments and ask questions in the chat. Our panelists will do their best to answer the questions after their presentation. We thank Mr. Bruno Paz for his assistance with translation in the chat, and we look forward to a very lively discussion there. Freshwater systems, including forests and fish, are at the heart of every functioning landscape across the world. Rivers, in fact, collect, connect all living things from the mountain ridgetops to the coral reefs, and that makes sustainable management a wicked problem. That's a problem that's difficult, but I don't believe in this case impossible to solve because of competing demands shifting needs and incomplete data. And the only solution to a wicked problem is true collaboration. So not just redistributing the workload or coordinating definitions, but accomplishing together far more than the sum of what could have been accomplished individually. It seems you agree. In the survey we circulated with the webinar announcement, 64% of you responded that collaboration across forestry and fisheries was not just useful, but in fact was essential for achieving the SDGs. Only 12% of you frequently observe such collaboration. And in fact, most of you rarely observe it. So today we have it. With that, I introduce my colleague from fisheries, John Jorgensen. Gracias, Ashley. Yo de mi parte, también quiero darles, darles la bienvenida al webinar, Río Resilientes, contando los peces del bosque. Primero, quisiera repetir los siguientes dos puntos técnicos en español. El programa será traducido simultáneamente entre español y inglés. Para escoger su idioma preferido, por favor presione el icono en forma de un globo pequeño ubicado en la parte inferior derecha de la pantalla. En un entorno virtual, la calidad del audio puede fallar inesperadamente hasta el punto que se vuelve inadecuada para fines de interpretación. Si eso sucede, los interpretadores indicarán el problema verbalmente y reanudarán la interpretación cuando la calidad del audio lo permita. Debido al gran número de participantes, no vamos a tener una sesión de preguntas y respuestas. En cambio, alentamos a todos que hagan sus comentarios y preguntas en el chat. Nuestros panelistas harán todo lo posible para responder a las preguntas en el chat después de cada presentación. Esperemos una discusión animada. Igual como mi colega, estoy muy emocionado por el gran número de participantes. 360 personas de 58 países registradas. Y de diferentes sectores y disciplinas, incluyendo ONG, academia, sector privado y gobiernos. Esto demuestra la relevancia del tema y la necesidad de reflexionar sobre la manera en la que estamos trabajando, sobre todo colaborando en nuestra lucha por una gestión sostenible de los recursos naturales y el logro de los ODS. A continuación, Tengo el gusto de introducir a Manuel Barranque, director de la División de Pesca en FAO, quien va a ofrecernos sus palabras de apertura. Manuel. Gracias, John and Ashley. Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes. Es un placer darles la bienvenida a todos. I will proceed in English for my introductory remarks. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this event on resilient rivers, counting fish from the forest. I would like to start by thanking the panelists for sharing the insights regarding freshwater ecosystem, their fisheries and forests. 
We hope that this webinar is just the beginning of a longer multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral dialogue. In fact, this seminar emerged from a recent funding allocation through FAO's multidisciplinary fund to connect some of our work on inland fisheries and on forests. This fund intends to strengthen collaboration across disciplines to increase FAO's effectiveness and to encourage creative measures. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, I thank you for showing up in such numbers and from around the globe, demonstrating the importance of today's topic. What we hope for today is to collectively demonstrate the interconnectedness of forestry and fisheries issues in their common freshwater environments. An interconnectedness that will provide unique opportunities for innovative collaborations. Let me talk briefly on inland water ecosystems. Inland waters cover just 1% of the Earth's surface, but about 50% of all fish species make use of them. These habitats are extremely varied, including streams, rivers, floodplains, lakes, ponds, deltas, and more. Set within broader landscapes, they exert major influences. These aquatic ecosystems are highly dynamic and very productive. For example, at least 12 million tons or 13% of the world's fish catches come from inland fisheries. Almost half of it comes from 50 low income food deficit countries and well over a million tons come from landlocked countries. In these nations, inland fisheries deliver much needed animal protein, nutrients, minerals, and vitamins. Inland fisheries are typically part of a mixed livelihood strategy. As such, they provide livelihood opportunities for people relying on access to common property resources, providing food for billions and livelihoods for millions worldwide, often to some of the most vulnerable and food insecure peoples. Forests and aquatic ecosystems in catchment areas are inextricably linked and dynamically interactive with many inland fisheries relying on freshwater habitats that are maintained and supported by forests. Floodplain forests, among the world's most endangered forest types, support natural river meanders and particularly diverse and productive fisheries. Headwater forests and forested catchments provide soil stability, decrease destructive overland flows during rainstorms, support groundwater recharge and reduce the risk of landslides into downstream rivers and habitats. Riparian forests provide shade, erosion protection, chemical buffering and nutritious terrestrial inputs to aquatic food webs. Flooded forests often support essential inland fisheries. To give a couple of more direct examples, the flooded forest around Cambodia's Great Lake, which the minister will speak about in a few minutes, give rise to one of the largest inland fisheries in the world. Fish are mobile organisms, organisms that move up and down river channels and in and out of floodplains and flooded forest where they feed on insects, fruits and seeds and find refuge. In another example, it has been estimated that 75% of commercial fish species in the Amazon are part of food webs that originate in the flooded forests. This fish could in fact be considered a non-wood forest product. But inland and freshwater systems are very much under threat. The Sustainable Development Goal 15.1 calls specifically to ensure the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of terrestrial and inland freshwater ecosystems and their services, thus further linking forests and inland fisheries. But while they contribute to many other SDGs, freshwater ecosystems are vulnerable and still insufficiently valued. They are subject to high rates of loss and degradation. Globally, wetlands are vanishing three times faster than forests, and freshwater vertebrate populations have declined more than twice as steeply as terrestrial populations, and even more steeply compared to marine populations. The past 30 years have seen a 50% decrease in populations of freshwater species. Threats and pressures arise chiefly from outside the fishery sector and include land use changes and degradation, deforestation, unsustainable agriculture, pollutions and poorly managed water uses. Experience has shown that restoring land and hydrologies can deliver significant and immediate gains in local fisheries 
as well as deliver co-benefits such as biodiversity conservation, productive and resilient agriculture, forest and water resources. Let's hope that this event will highlight win-win solutions regarding collective conservation and sustainable use of freshwater ecosystems and forests and guide us further in our work. And with that, I would like to follow the event by introducing His Excellency Ven Sakon, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries of Cambodia, who is joining us on a video link. With one of the largest inland fisheries in the world, the linkages between forests and fisheries management are perhaps more clearly shown in Cambodia than in any other country. More importantly, the Cambodian government is a leader in having acknowledged this interrelationship and in having demonstrated its commitment to ensuring environmental sustainability for the benefit of its population. Thank you very much for your attention. Technical colleagues, over to you and to the video. Madam Director, Mette Wilkie, Mr. Director, Manuel Baranchi, panelists, fishery and forestry expert, ladies and gentlemen. Fishery and forestry are the main natural resources for the livelihood of Cambodian people and the national economy in, of Cambodia. Cambodia inland fishery, one of the largest and most significant in the world, consists of more than 500 of species. The richness of fish seen thousands of the year and is the memorized on the wall of the ancient Angkor Wat temple. Until recently, up to 700,000 tons of fish were caught every year. In addition to 60,000 tons of other Akatis uh, animals such as shrimp, crab, snail, frog, insects, snakes, and turtle. Cambodia is also rich in terrestrial biodiversity, including the third largest lowland dry evergreen forest in Southeast Asia, with 2,300 plant species and 14 endangered animals. In fact, almost half of Cambodia is forested with nearly 8 million hectares of naturally generating forest. Across the nation, forests provide benefit to fresh water system, forests high up in the mountain, protect soils, and forest store water in the rainy season that become essential dry season flow. Forests that line stream, lakes, and river provide such protection from erosion. Cambodia is also home to 500,000 hectares of flooded forests and over 50,000 hectares of mangrove forests. Forests that are even more closely tied to fishery, which is habitat and source of natural food for fish. Forests and fishery are the foundation of livelihood and our economy. Nearly 4 million people, or more than 30% of the population, live with the 5 kilometers of the forest, with forest resources accounting for an average of 10 to 20% of household consumption sources. Cambodian forests also product wood, product that produce that when harvested sustainably and support the economy, provide livelihood and rural area, and even store carbon and mitigate climate change. 
million of Cambodian find employment in fishery related activity. Fish and rice remain the nation's staple food. Fish and other aquatic animals are crucial for nutrition and food security because they provide Cambodian people with 80% of their animal protein and much of their essential with tamin and mineral, particularly calcium and vitamin A and fish oil. Inland fishery are also of the fundamental important to economy as they contribute 60% to the country GDP. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I understand the close relationship between fish, forest, and livelihood are crucial, important, and cannot be guaranteed by the fishery or forestry administration alone. It requires collective effort and collaboration from all sectors involved management. The forest is essential for productive fishery that can meet the need of the Cambodian people. Sustainable management of fishery also has benefit for forest and forest dependent people. The government has taken many actions to support forest and fishery. In 1997, the Cambodian government established the Tundisa Biosphere Reserve that cover 1.5 million hectares and which is devoted to the long-term protection and conservation of natural resources and the ecosystem and specifically to preserve flooded forests, fish, wildlife, hydrological system, and natural beauty. In several areas around the Great Lake, we are restoring access for the fish to flood this area, including the flooded forest, with great benefit for the local people. The government is also implementing policy and law that allow villagers more rights and responsibility to protect and manage natural resources, ensuring stakeholder participation at the community level. We really need to have a holistic and multidisciplinary approach to water set management, protection and restoration of ecosystem for the benefit of people and nature. As I said in the beginning, natural resources are central to the live of the Cambodian. Our time, we have gained at a lot of experience about their sustainable management, and many of these lessons have been learned together with the partner, such as FAO, and we are happy to share this experience with all of you. I wish to conclude my thinking, thanking the organizer for inviting me to address you and this important meeting and all of you for attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for these inspiring words and also policies. We are grateful for your leadership in integrated forest and fisheries management and for your contributions to our events. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Robert Bilby, Senior Scientific Advisor for Weyerhaeuser Corporation. With four decades of experience supporting private sector restoration of forests for fish, many of you in the participant survey mentioned riparian forestry and restoration as primary activities for achieving the SDGs and provided examples from Switzerland to Ghana. Now, with an example from the Pacific Northwest USA, the floor is yours.
Okay, thank you, thank you, Ashley. I think we're all set here. As Ashley indicated, uh, I was asked today to provide a presentation on the process that has evolved in the Pacific Northwest over the last 40 years um, to better coordinate forest management with the protection of aquatic ecosystems and fisheries in the region. Uh, both forestry and fisheries prior to 1950 were the primary drivers of the economy in the Pacific Northwest, and they both remain major industries in, in the region. However, historic forest management, as I'll show you in a few minutes, severely damaged both freshwater habitats and to some extent estuarine habitats in the region, and as a result, contributed to the decline in the fisheries resources in the region. But over the last 40 years, and <laughs> Unfortunately, I've been around for most of this. There have been a, a series of improvements in the practices, forestry practices around freshwater habitats that have had a really beneficial effect on the quality of our, our environment in the region. The area that I'm talking about today is circled here in red. It's that blue green strip along the coastline that extends from Southeast Alaska all the way down into Northern California. Uh, this is an area that has both incredibly productive forests as well as some of the most productive fisheries in the world, most valuable fisheries in the world. Um, taking a look at the forest, this is a chart that represents relative forest production across the globe. Uh, and in this case, the uh, growth of eucalyptus plantations in New Zealand and South America is arbitrarily set at 100. You can see that the only forests in the northern hemisphere that actually approach the kind of productivity we see in southern hemisphere eucalypt forests are the, the softwood forest in the U.S. Pacific Northwest. So it's an incredibly productive environment for forests. As a result, let me give you some indication of the kinds of economic activity associated with forestry. And here I will just use as an example some figures from one particular jurisdiction in the Pacific Northwest, the state of Washington. In Washington, as of 2011, when this information was generated, there were 1,700 forest businesses in the state, employing 42,000 workers and paying about $3 billion annually in wages. Total economic activity associated with forestry in Washington state is about $28 billion US dollars per year. And you can multiply that figure by about six times to cover the entire Pacific Northwest region. So forestry still remains a very, very big economic driver in the region. Fisheries is also important, although because of depressed fish stocks, it's not nearly as economically uh, active as it was historically, particularly south of the Canadian border, but still, it is a fairly important source of, of both income and jobs. There's 16,500 fisheries jobs in Washington state, and it generates about $500 million US dollars per year in economic activity. Of those fish, one is of particular significance when we talk about this nexus between forest management and fisheries, and that is salmon. Uh, there are a number of salmon species in the Pacific Northwest. Historically, they were a critically important component of the fisheries. However, they are greatly depressed, uh, so that the, 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 the amount that are caught each year is quite, quite a bit lower than it was historically. But even more important than the economic significance of these fish is their cultural importance, particularly to native cultures in the Pacific Northwest. And these truly are uh, revered fish in the region. To give you some idea about their status now, south of the Canadian border, over the last 20 years, 27 populations have been given protection under the U.S. Endangered Species Act because of the high probability of extirpation of these populations. So they really have, have been severely affected by a variety of factors, forestry being one of these. So let's take a look at how historic factors forest practices impacted aquatic habitats. Uh, prior to about 1970, forestry was conducted in a way that was not particularly protective of aquatic environments. Uh, all the trees within a broad area were cut. Those trees were then yarded up to a landing uh, using typically cable systems. 
And some of the logs that they collected were quite large. We grow some very large trees here in the Pacific Northwest. But the result was this figure shown in the upper right. And this is a figure that a picture that was taken in the 19, mid 1960s. So it's not that old, depending on your, on your context. But this is what the landscape looked like. Uh, all the trees are gone. After the trees were harvested, the area was burned to facilitate replanting with young trees, but there was no protection afforded for the stream flowing down there through the, the, the valley in the picture. This is a salmon bearing stream. So obviously uh, this was, these were a sets of practices that had really consequential effects on aquatic ecosystems. One practice was particularly dramatic and the results of this particular practice are still evident today throughout the Northwest. And that is the process that was used until the 1950s to transport logs from the forest down to the sawmill where they were processed. And this was called the log drive. Essentially trees were cut. They were then cut into logs approximately 15 meters in length. And all of these logs were deposited in a stream channel or a small river channel. Then a structure upstream called the splash dam was opened releasing a rush of water, to then moved downstream to where the logs had been placed in the stream channel, where those logs were floated, and then log drivers or log rollers riding on top of these floating logs coming down the stream would herd these things downstream until they got to the sawmill. This was a practice that had massive impacts on the aquatic ecosystems throughout the Pacific Northwest. It was direct mortality of organisms living in the stream at the time one of these drives occurred, Banks were eroded, riparian vegetation was removed, and the effects of this practice are still quite evident throughout most of the drainage networks in the Pacific Northwest today. So we are still attempting to recover from this particular type of, of management, even though it stopped uh, over 70 years ago. So about 1960s, 1970s, people began to recognize that forestry was playing a role in pressing fish stocks throughout the region. And at that time, we began the long process, uh, sometimes painful process, contentious process of developing management prescriptions, management measures that would ensure the protection of aquatic habitats and allow the recovery of these very, impor in very important fish populations. And the uh, <clears throat> The entire process really was, was based on one fairly simple principle. And that was the belief that if we could very specifically identify those portions of the landscape that had the greatest degree of interaction with aquatic ecosystems, we could focus our protective measures at these sites. And by doing that, both enable a high degree of protection for aquatic habitats, and at the same time, allowing a forest landowner to manage most of his property for the continued production of wood. So what are these, these important areas? Well, really in the Pacific Northwest, we've focused on four primary issues related to forest management and its effects on aquatic systems. The first is the protection of riparian areas, including floodplains. The second are forest roads. Once log drives were done, uh, logs were taken from the forest to the mill by trucks. Obviously, they required roads. Roads both generate considerable amounts of sediment, and they also uh, create, in many cases, barriers to the upstream passage of fish. The Pacific Northwest also is quite steep, and we get quite a lot of rainfall. As a result, landslides are an issue. And Forest practices, both road construction and logging, can increase the frequency of landslides. The final issue that was addressed during the evolution of these, these uh, forest management prescriptions was forest chemicals. And I'm not going to talk much about the chemical part of this today. Really, chemi the chemical concern is focused on potential impacts on human health. So it clearly is a critical concern. But it's been less of an issue when talking about aquatic ecosystems. During the 1970s, uh, people first began to talk about affording some protection for riparian systems uh, in on forest, unmanaged forest landscapes. And the concern at that time was primarily with water temperature. The thought being that removing the trees from the stream edge, removed shade, allowed sunlight to hit the water, 
increasing water temperature, which is bad for salmon, which are cold water fish. So in the mid 1970s, the first set of riparian prescriptions in the Pacific Northwest was developed. However, these were not particularly stringent measures. And as a matter of fact, they were not really, they didn't really result in any consistent buffering of the streams. There were a couple of loopholes. One was that no streams above 700 meters in elevation, that was in Washington state, required buffers. The thought being that streams at higher elevation were naturally cold and didn't need the shade. Second, the second loophole was that uh, people didn't, landowners did not have to retain trees at sites where the trees might get blown over. Well, the Pacific Northwest during the wintertime gets frequent large storms that come in off of the Pacific Ocean. And you can make the case uh, that trees anywhere could blow down. So as a result, very few buffers were left during the 1970s. It wasn't until the 1980s that we got a set of rules and regulations that required the consistent protection of forested buffers along streams. And this occurred as, as partly as a result of the increased appreciation for the important role that, that riparian zones play not only in protecting water temperature, but also for some other functions, including input of large wood into stream channels, which is an important structural component of stream systems, create pools, regulates material movement in the stream. Here's a figure that shows a large number of salmon utilizing a pool formed by a piece of large wood, and also litter input, input of leaves and needles, which is an important energy source that supports the food webs in stream and river systems. So as a result of what happened in the 80s, buffers were finally required consistently on all aquatic habitats that supported fish. These, this buffering system was further enhanced in the 1990s into the early 2000s. Uh, and the changes included, a pro included the protection of floodplains, no forest management whatsoever on floodplains, recognizing the important role they play in maintaining productive fisheries. And also buffering was extended upstream beyond the areas that were actually occupied by fish. Uh, the concern here being that these small streams, although they didn't directly support fish, impacts on those small streams ultimately could be transported downstream to fish bearing reaches and as a result impact the productivity of those systems. So now in the Pacific Northwest, I think we have relatively good buffering prescriptions that are applied pretty consistently throughout the entire region. In Washington, our buffers average about, about 60 meters on either side of the stream with some light management allowed at the outer edge of those buffers, and we completely protect floodplains. Let's talk a little bit now about, about roads, the second big issue. Uh, roads have two major problems. One is that they can generate sediment, and they generate sediment in two ways. One is the crushing of the road surface by traffic, and then subsequently the washing of that road surface during rainstorms, that sediment moves into roadside ditches. And historically, Prior to the 1990s, those roadside ditches were drained directly into streams and rivers. The other way that roads affect sediment delivery is through um, improper road location, which leads to landslides. Landslides move massive amounts of sediment downstream, and nine times out of 10, a landslide winds up in a stream channel. The other impact that roads have is that where a stream passes a road, in many cases, a, a fish passage blockage occurs. So what we've done over time here in the Pacific Northwest is implement a series of measures that are designed to reduce the production of sediment from road surfaces. These include things like requirements to use hard surfacing materials that breaks down more slowly under traffic. But most significantly, the, the one management prescription that's had the greatest effect is the deliberate disconnection of the road drainage network, the roadside ditches, from natural drainage networks in watersheds. Ditch water is now drained off uh, onto the forest floor at sufficient distance from a natural drainage uh, channel so that that water can soak into the soil, leaving the sediment behind. And this has been really very a very effective mechanism for reducing sediment delivery to streams. Passage blockages were a huge problem on forest roads prior to about 2000. Since that time, uh, forest landowners have committed in the Northwest to fixing these issues. 
And that requires the installation of a, of a crossing structure that has a natural stream bed in the bottom, not a pipe. Uh, because you have to provide passage both for the adult fish, which are actually quite athletic and capable of making it through some barriers that in some cases are hard to believe, but also for the juvenile fish that are rearing in these systems uh, for most, most of the time during the year. And they cannot get through anything that's particularly, particularly difficult. So this is an example of one such culvert replacement. Went from this round pipe uh, with a large fall at the, at the downstream end to this arch pipe, which has natural materials in the bed. Finally, landslides. Landslides were a huge problem in the Pacific Northwest. Any kind of management activity, road construction, forest harvest on an unstable hill slope feature frequently leads to a landslide. Starting in the 1990s, uh, we began to develop processes in the Pacific Northwest to help us identify where these unstable hill slope features were, and then gave us the ability to prohibit any kind of management activity on those unstable, site, unstable sites. Uh, this process involves uh, an in the office exercise, looking at available data sources, maps, LIDAR coverage if they have it, and then using that process to identify sites on the ground that appear may have stability issues. And subsequently an on the ground visit to the site and then ultimately the development of a map that indicates where trees can be harvest, harvested and where trees cannot be harvested. This particular example, the red lines, represents the outline of the area that's logged. The green line is the uh, area set aside for riparian buffers. And then these orange polygons represent areas where the slopes are unsafe, no road building or forest harvest is allowed in those locations. So over time in the Pacific Northwest, we have developed a pretty comprehensive set of management prescriptions for the protection of aquatic habitats. And this has had beneficial effects. Uh, but, the managed, but the mechanism that we've used over the last 40 years primarily for uh, implementing these new management procedures has been regulatory. It's been mandatory regulations. But in the last 20 years, there have been a number of new tools that have been added to the toolbox that can help us encourage more sustainable forest management. One of these is, uh, is uh, the, the process of forest certification, which is essentially a market-based system to encourage sustainable forest management. Uh, in this kind of a system, customers commit to purchasing wood products and wood only from, from producers who can demonstrate that they are generating that material sustainably. And the way that, that the, a landowner would do this is by getting certified through one of the existing forest certification systems. Globally, one of the big ones is FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, in Canada, in the, in the US, in North America, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, one, one that is very commonly used. But the idea here is that these certification systems contain standards. If a, a landowner commits to <clears throat> Meeting these standards, it undergoes an audit. He then gets uh, certified. He can put that certification seal on his products. And as a result, it increases his access to the market. This has been a very effective tool at generating more sustainable forest management worldwide. The other opportunity that we have going forward is beginning to develop systems for monetizing ecosystem goods and services beyond simply wood. And that includes some things that have already developed. There is some, some opportunity to get, for a landowner to get compensation for carbon sequestration. In the US, the Environmental Protection Agency runs a, a program called Wetland Mitigation Banking, where landowners get compensated for maintaining wetlands in high quality condition. It's also biomass energy and some of the sustainability uh, requirements associated with that. And conservation eas easements in the US have been used broadly to uh, encourage more sustainable forest management. So I think that we've done a relatively good job in the Pacific Northwest over the last 40 years of developing a system that protects aquatic ecosystems. There are some opportunities to do things a little bit better in the future. However, I, I, I do think that there's a takeaway message from the Pacific Northwest that can be broadly applied to other forested regions in the world. And that is, if you in fact can identify these areas that are particularly important for maintaining 
the health of aquatic ecosystems and focus protective measures at those sites, I think it is possible to have both healthy, productive fisheries and still maintain a viable, economically viable forest products industry. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Wilby, por compartir una experiencia tan rica y valiosa con nosotros. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. That was extremely interesting. We're going to go south to Colombia with Mr. Mauricio Valderrama, director of the Fundación Humedales. He has carried out research in fisheries resources and has carried out environmental and fisheries management activities for sustainable use in wetlands in Magdalena, the Amazon River and other areas. He's going to tell us about how to strengthen the local governance of fisheries and how to carry out activities to achieve integral sustainability in the basin of the Magdalena River in Colombia. You have the floor, sir. Good morning. I thank FAO for the invitation. What I am going to show you in a few minutes is a process that we have carried out in Colombia in order to strengthen fisheries governance, as well as some activities that contribute within an integral framework that contribute to the sustainability of the Magdalena River Basin. This is a process that started uh, more than six years ago initially with two fishermen associations, then three, now there are four. And uh, we provide support and accompaniment from the beginning with the National Fisheries Authority, which is uh, uh, known as AUNAP in Colombia. Let us begin to look at the Magdalena River Basin. It is in the northern part of South America. In the center of the country, we have the Magdalena River Basin. It, 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 the source is in the Andes, and it ends up in the Caribbean. And it goes through the Andean Valleys, the Magdalena River, 1,538 kilometers. It has uh, more than 3 million hectares associated with aquatic ecosystems. It is also the basin that receives a lot of pressure in the country. It is the main basin of the country, more than 40 million inhabitants, 78% of the population and we produce 80% of the GDP, electricity, and coffee production as well, and thermal electricity, as well as agricultural production. So original ecosystems have suffered from this pressure. And Obviously, fisheries uh, resources have also been affected. In the red circle, you see the Magdalena River. It is the most important fisheries area of the basin. Let's look at the fish. In the Magdalena River Basin, we have 233 species, 68% of them are endemic, with a biodiversity that is one of the country's patrimony. 91 are the object of fishing, 65 are for human consumption, trade, and food, and 40 are simply ornamental. And then eight species have been introduced that have been brought to the area. 
by accident, it wasn't planned. And amongst all of those species, we have the barred soribum that has the highest, uh, th represents the highest uh, threat. And it is considered uh, uh, as a morose species. In the last 40 years, we see in this graph how the fishery production in the Magdalena Basin has had a 64% reduction. More than half of the fisheries production has disappeared in the last 40 years. We also see that the Sorubim is the second species of production. It has the greatest uh, commercial value. And we've considered the annual production in 16.8 million dollars. That is back in 2017. So the basin is a very important with a lot of, it is subjected to a lot of pressure and we need to carry out management and conservation activities for the governance of all of our fisheries. Who are our fishermen? We have 32,000 fishermen that live around the area, 157,000 people are the direct beneficiaries uh, from this source of employment. Uh, the rural population is rather poor with uh, less than the monthly minimum legal wages. Uh, they have uh, very little, there is very little generational shift. They have uh, bad living conditions. They have now understood what their role can be in terms of organization and conservation. We also have a complex environment within an area that is subject to many pressures. The forest cover has been reducing steadily in the last 50 years. The Population has been increasing, catchment areas have been growing, the production of gold has been growing, and that entails uh, a lot of problems for the environment, a lot of contamination. We have the loss of connectivity. We have a complex environmental situation. And right now, 90% of our fisheries production in a research we have just completed is explained by environmental variables. Overfishing is no longer the main cause of the reduction of our fisheries resources. So the problem is in the integral management of the area. We need to understand the environment, the forests, the rivers and the catchment areas. This is the landscape of Carare Chukuri. That is where we began. And now we have other associations in Barranca de Mera. This is the area of the Magdalena River. We started here, 57 kilometers of river, 300 fishermen, and four uh, fishermen's associations have joined the process. So we see the culture that is associated with the fish, with the fishing activities, the canoes, the ports, and this is the reality of our landscape. Uh, we started the process with all the fishermen uh, with conservation strategies based on local knowledge, trying to achieve the management of the territory. And uh, we have the classical management of uh, the fisheries resources. Uh, we asked the questions so, such as, can we go beyond the classical management of fisheries in uh, with unofficial norms? Do these contribute to the conservation of the species? How can we make the local system more resilient? And so with the support of other fisheries organizations, we started carrying out social 
uh, analysis workshops with a participant process with our fishermen who are obtaining and producing information on the effort, the size of our fish, the uh, times of abundance, the seasons of abundance, community management uh, to reach agreements, management uh, agreements. Uh, we have created a local committee for fisheries management. That is where we meet the and discuss and twice a year we have consultation processes with planning and the interinstitutional structure both in the local community and regional levels that is what we started doing in 2014 with fisheries agreements we have uh, some norms that are unofficial, but that can be observed. We reached an agreement to protect the breeding season. We have had changes in the flows and flow rates of the river. So we need to have the seasonal closure exactly when the breeding is taking place. Here you see the size of landings of catch, the allowable catches. It We speak in terms of pounds of fish. We also have uh, rules for our fishing gear in our uh, agreements, depending on the seasons and so on and so forth. We have reservoir areas to define a conservation uh, strategy. For sorobims, we have four reserved areas, two are special management, and one is in an area where it is completely forbidden to fish in swamps. Roughly 1,300 hectares have been protected. And what was important was that the fishing authority authorized these agreements, endorsed them, producing an, an administrative uh, certificate that adopted the recommendations amongst the fishermen, as we had done with the seasonal closure to allow breeding and reproduction. And the fishermen themselves are carrying out the follow-up uh, and monitoring, they themselves uh, collect the information, process it, and distribute it with our support, but they're becoming more independent in producing their own information. Then we have the monitoring of the reserved areas. Uh, we carry out educational activities, uh, assessment activities, and we also define some levels of adherence to the agreement. Here you can see the months, the years. Each figure represents an agreement, the sizes, the gear, and the level, the level of compliance. The important thing is that in time, we have improved our compliance rate in the six years. We have constantly improved. We carry out evaluations and assessments every month and uh, discuss it all in our meetings at the Sorobim table. What we do is present and analyze the results of the processes we propose uh, management measures. We try to improve the trust between institutions and the community, and we try to bring the state closer to the community. We have two meetings a year with uh, all the stakeholders and entities uh, uh, involved, uh, the national associations that deal with uh, fisheries and other sectors as well. And we try to 
have the participation of all the local stakeholders in uh, the Son Robin table, La Mesa del Bagre. Now, we have uh, helped them understand that it is necessary to carry out conservation activities to protect uh, the territory. We carry out educational activities with children in all of our schools. We have developed educational projects in all of the schools and the fishermen themselves are the teachers. They themselves show their children the importance of uh, the fisheries. We also have uh, connectivity, restoration activities for our flood lands. The lack of connectivity is one of our more serious problems. And then we have rehabilitation for forests in our floodable plains, the relationship that of the forests with the fish, with productivity, with the environmental services that water ecosystems provide. We carry out rehabilitation activities. We have a small plant production structure, as you can see. We have a freshwater project so that people may access uh, clean fresh water. And we have projects uh, with the protection measures of the quality of water and uh, in Bocas de Carare, we also have these. All of these activities for the purification of water are within an integral, holistic protection of the territory and of the waterways. What are our reflections? We began six years ago and we have uh, now a social, environmental, and economic transformation process in the implied uh, locations. It is sad to say, but some of these had been abandoned by the state. The state was barely present. And so they barely have access to communication systems. The best practices in fishing agreements are complied with in a reasonable manner as we showed. And this is a clear contribution to the conservation of the barred sorobim. It's a small area, but it can act as a pilot to replicate it elsewhere in the basin of the river. We have already started the process in other regions continuity for more than five years of the Mesa del Bagre of our meetings has managed to uh, create a regional planning and coordination tool. Uh, the sector has become more resilient and the implementation of complementary activities to improve the quality of life and the reduction of poverty have strengthened our process. We are now working on consolidating the ind uh, ind financial independence of associations to ensure the st sustainability of the process so that they may feel they own the process themselves and so that they may fund it in the future as well from their own associations. So these are the institutions uh, that uh, have supported us, that have helped us out. And I would like to thank the fishing authority that has always supported us. Uh, they have always been with us from the start. And all of these entities have supported us and continue giving us their support. So I hope I have been able to illustrate uh, the Governance, strengthening of governance and complementary activities process that we are carrying out in the Magdalena River Basin in Colombia. And I hope you have found it interesting. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.
Mr. Valderrama, it's been my pleasure to learn about your work before this webinar. And now to hear it about it in more detail is really a great opportunity. Thank you for this excellent presentation. So again, referring to our pre-webinar survey of participant opinions, you ranked various types of activities in terms of their priority for achieving the SDGs, particular target 15.1. And the highest ranked activities were development of inter or multidisciplinary management frameworks, capacity building and watershed planning, including forestry, fisheries, and water management, and importantly, implementation of cross-sectoral river basin management plans. So with over 25 years of experience in uh, intersectoral river basin management planning, I would like to introduce Mr. Evans Kaseki. He's worked for the World Bank, for UNESCO, and the African Development Bank, and he is currently the program manager for the Zambezi River Strategic Plan. Mr. Kaseki, the floor is yours, and I will begin to share the presentation. Please let me know when you want me to change slides. All right, uh, we can get going. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, I think to, to maximize on my bandwidth over here, I'll just switch off the, the video for the moment. Um, but just to show who I am, uh, this is uh, Evans Kasek uh, from the Zambezi Water Coast Commission. And uh, as already been um, um, introduced, I'm responsible for strategic planning, development of uh, instruments of um, cooperation in the Zambezi Water Coast. Thank you. So I'll switch off my video and focus on the presentation. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is to share with you um, framework, the large framework that we've developed in the Zambezi for cooperative management of this particular natural resource. Um, before I can embark on the presentation, I would like to inform the meeting that um, um, the Zambezi has been designated um, a fishery, a significant fishery in Southern Africa. And um, this has been done through activities that we've uh, embarked on with um, the African Union. I think some of you, you know, AU AIBA, which is actually fronting the development of fisheries in Africa. Um, the Southern African Development Community, uh, SADC, the fisheries division, we are actually at the Zambes Commission. We are actually part of the technical committee of the African Union on Fisheries, the SADC Committee uh, on Fisheries. So there's quite a lot of work that we have been doing together with uh, these two key organizations, the continental as well as the regional on the development uh, of fisheries in Southern Africa. And some, um, my presentation is going to be on multi-sectoral management of large rivers, and in this case, the Zambezi watercourse. Let's go on to the second. Um, next slide, please. Um, the outline of my presentation, um, amongst the, the key items that I will be focusing on, um, Zambezi watercourse key features, Zambezi water course, the definition, this is very important so that, you know, everybody is on a par, is at par with the kind of feature that we're actually talking about. The governance structure of Zamcom, this is very critical for cooperative management of, uh, you know, these large features, these transboundary uh, features. Then I will also move on to the key challenges the ones that actually galvanized, that actually galvanized the eight countries in the Zambezi water course to get together and you know produce and come up with the Zambezi water course commission. Then also I'll move on to the opportunities for enhanced cooperation amongst the eight countries. I will touch on the vision, which is the preferred development future then I'll move on to the key instrument of cooperation 
the main framework within which uh, the Zambezi is now being managed and within which fisheries, the issue of fisheries is actually going to be managed. Then I'll end up with um, the, for, the foreseen benefits of um, cooperation. Next slide, please. Um, the Zambezi water course key features amongst the others are that it is the fourth largest river in Africa after the Nile, the Congo, and the Niger. And just to give you a, an example, when we compare, for example, the discharge of um, the Zambezi with respect to the Congo, when the Congo, when they say, you know, it's a drought year, and there's not much water in, uh, in the Congo, just downstream of Kinshasa, we are talking of 41, around 40,000 cubic meters per second. That is a very large um, discharge. And then we talk of the Zambezi, probably at its mouth, we'll be talking around 7,000 cubic meters anything up to 10, 15,000 cubic meters per second in a very good season. So when you compare it with the Nile, the Niger, um, the Zambezi is somewhere there, but not as large. Then also another key feature of the Zambezi, it's actually a water course, which is shared by eight countries that are the republics of Angola, Botswana, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. And what brings these countries together is an agreement which they actually signed in 2004. And it's actually called the um, Agreement on the Establishment of the Zambezi Water Course Commission. That's the one which actually the organization that presides over this uh, transboundary uh, system is actually the Zambezi Water Course Commission. And another key feature, the mean annual runoff, this is very important, water which is available, you know, for development. Um, mean annual runoff is around 200 billion cubic meters per second. And this water, actually, this is very important. When we are talking about fisheries, this is it. And when we talk of deforestation, it adversely impacts on the availability of this resource for the management and for the availability of viable um, um, fisheries. And then also it's very important to talk about the people within the Zambezi water course. At the moment, we are talking of around 45 million people who, and the population is projected to be around 50 to 55 million around 2025. So when we talk of the population, the people, we are actually also focusing on the issue of dependence that population is dependent on the resources that are available within the Zambezi water course. And you can also imagine the, depends, uh, the dependence on not only the water, but also the issues that will arise. And in this case, we're talking about water pollution. It adversely impacts on the availability of quality water for fish, you know, for breeding as well as, you know, the environment that they need to thrive in. So we are talking of issues that are actually interlinked, that are interwoven, that uh, can adversely or positively impact on fisheries. Next slide, please. Next slide, yes. Um, before I can go on, it's very important that, you know, we get to know what, um, um, the Zambezi is. The Zambezi is actually defined as a water course. That definition is actually opt is enshrined 
in the United Nations Convention on Non-Navigational Uses of Water. That's where it actually originates from. Then that was cascaded down to the Southern African uh, revised protocol on shared water courses. Water courses are what we have uh, in Southern Africa. We don't have really river basins because with the river basins, you're actually focusing on the liquids that you actually find within those uh, drainage basins. But with the water course, the definition is the system of surface and ground waters of the Zambezi constituting by virtue of their physical relationship, a unitary whole flowing normally into a common terminus. And in this case, the, Zambezi, the Indian Ocean. The Zambezi water course is perceived broadly to also include the topography of the landscape and associated lands of the Zambezi River. So we are talking of the Zambezi River in association with all the lands that are actually um, in its um, catchment. Let's go on to the next. Next, yes. And after the feature, we also have to take note of the situation that, you know, for the water course commission to operate, there is a structure that, is, that was actually set up and this is actually enshrined in the agreement which is um, um, which was signed in 2004. And the highest decision making body within the Zambezi Water Course Commission is the Council of Ministers. And at the moment, we're talking of ministers of water. They are the key officials that sit in that body. So they decide, they actually endorse and approve um, activities that are actually carried out year in, year out within the Zambezi water course. And just below the technical, the, the council of ministers, um, there's the technical committee. These are primarily permanent secretaries and directors from the ministries of water. But these two organs, the Council of Ministers, it has the mandate to actually share what is occurring within the, within the Zambezi water course with other ministers from other sectors, as well as you know, informing the heads of states, the presidents, the prime ministers on activities that are actually going on uh, within the Zambezi um, um, water course. And it is through these two key organizations that you know the issue of ownership is anchored within the um, the Zambezi Water Course. Then the Secretariat, where I sit, this is actually where we have got the mandate to actually operationalize to implement decisions of council, right? And below the uh, secretariat, there are specialized working groups. For example, if now we are going to be embarking on uh, the development of a framework for cooperative management of fisheries in the Zambezi water course, that entails that, you know, we have to actually put together a specialist group of experts who are very specialized in fisheries. So they are the ones who actually sit in that particular group and advise and drive the process of developing a framework, a regional framework for the development and management of fisheries. Also, what I wish to um, share with the meeting is that um, the Zambezi Water, Water Course Commission, its activities are actually anchored in a very strong water set, um, water course, multi, -stake, multi, -stake, multi sectoral stakeholder activity. So the multi sector um, component plays a major, major role in the development and management of uh, all sectors, sectoral activities within this amazing water course. 
So this is primarily what happens is what comes out of the multi-sectoral stakeholder um, level, which is right at the bottom there, which is the foundation. That's what actually is pushed right up to the Council of Ministers. So the Council of Ministers are actually mandated to actually deal with what comes, what is recommended from the lower levels. And those, those lower levels include, um, we're talking of the public sector, we're talking of the private sector, we're talking of the NGOs, we're talking of our rural people, the ordinary person who is the key beneficiary of the activities of the commission is actually the one who um, uh, will sit in that um, uh, particular organ right at the bottom. Let's go on to the next um, slide. The key challenges that were identified, that were identified, you know, throughout the Zambezi Water Coast Commission were actually de de identified through a very intense uh, stakeholder consultative process. This actually started around 2004, after, soon after the signing of the, um, of the agreement. And there was a strategy, an integrated water resources management strategy for the Zambezi, which was produced in 2008. That is a key document whereby stakeholder, stakeholders, multi-sectoral stakeholders articulated these particular challenges, you know, for the Zambezi. We know that um, when it comes to challenges, we can have specifics like um, water pollution, we can have environmental degradation, uh, climate change, all those are challenges. But what are the key overarching challenges? These are the key challenges that were actually articulated by stakeholders and these actually touch on all the other um, what all the other um, challenges we can think of: climate change, environmental degradation. And in this case, the first one um, was articulated as persistent poverty, and that there is the need for equitable and resilient development. These are the broad statements that were actually articulated crystallized, you know, from the uh, multi-sectoral multi uh, stakeholder consultations. The next one, it was uh, articulated that um, they, there is competition, there's, they are competing uses for water. In this case, we are talking of um, hydropower, agriculture, um, urban industrial, and of importance there, there's need for balanced development. Right, then also another key challenge, infrastructure deficit. This is very key, you know, when um, we talk of um, uh, development, we're talking of here yeah, infrastructure, it's not just water. For the Zambezi, um, if I could, the Zambezi Commission, it's actually anchored within a multi-sectoral um, spectrum. So here, we, when we talk of, um, infrastructure deficit, we're talking of energy, we're talking of transport roads, we are talking of, uh, you know, the green energy, there's the green infrastructure, we are talking of the uh, gray infrastructure. So one of the key, um, key desires of uh, the stakeholders, there is need for infrastructure development. Uh, also, environmental degradation, this is another key challenge that was actually um, that was um, um, identified by the stakeholders. Environmental degradation, we're talking of pollution, all sorts of pollution, um, deforestation, um, um, and that, you know, there's need for sustainable development as well. And here we're talking of environmental resources uh, development and, um, and uh, protection. Then also another key challenge, which is always um, experienced within the water course, 
disasters, disaster risk was a key challenge that was identified. And here, um, for, by, for the stakeholders, the need for climate resilient development. So issues of climate change, they come in very strongly. So let's go on to the next, next slide, please. The key opportunities for sustainable development in the Zambezi watercourse were also identified by multi-sectoral um, stakeholder consultations as pent up socioeconomic development uh, demand in the region. There is demand for socioeconomic uh, development in the region, be it agriculture, in energy, in transport and manufacturing. That's why one would find that, you know, um, like at the Southern African community development level, industrialization has been prioritized because there is need for that in respect to also to uplifting the standards of um, living of, um, of the populations. Then also demonstrable political will to cooperate. This is a key feature that actually is driving the processes in the Zambezi watercourse. A very good example, the political will to cooperate. We are talking of um, the signing of the 2004 agreement after years of negotiation. And as of 2019, we have witnessed actually the adoption of a new framework of uh, operation and planning for the Zambezi watercourse. And this is the strategic plan for the Zambezi watercourse. Then also we're talking of legal and institutional frameworks that have been agreed on as instruments of cooperation. Examples, the agreement, the revised protocol on shared water courses, the strategic plan, all those, they constitute the legal framework. And what to, for these to come into being, the political willingness to cooperate is a key feature. And also what I want to share with the meeting is these legal and institutional frameworks, they come about through a very strong multi-sectoral um, stakeholder uh, consultative process. These are pro products of those processes. Then we are also talking of strong and extensive analytical foundations. In the Zambezi, um, we have got um, lots of studies that are actually going on, generation of information and data that is actually going to be, that is very useful for informing decision-making. As we are just talking, I can give you a very good example. We have just been granted um, a multi-million dollar grant by the European Union to actually embark on serious studies. Those studies, the world, they generate information and data. They will also be uh, generating, you know, experts at the masters and doctorate levels, you know, in the various multi-sectoral fields that are of importance to the um, Zambia's water course. So this is actually an in, um, a bonus, a plus for the Zambezi water course. Then also through another World Bank study called the um, Missioa multi-sector investment opportunity analysis study, they, there was an identification that, you know, um, there is actually uh, opportunities for investments in infrastructure with more than 16 billion. And some of it, you know, we've just recently um, witnessed the commissioning of a bridge, 360 million bridge uh, on the Zambezi that is from Botswana to, to Zambia, but all the other countries are also involved. That is what we are talking about. Um, the potential for cooperative investments in poverty alleviating, alleviating infrastructure. This is important. We have got a program actually called, um, with a, a program called um, 
Credit Climate Resilient Infrastructure Development Facility, which is actually funded by the UK government to the tune of, I think it's over a billion pounds. That is actually going to be, it has been operating, investing in infrastructure that is actually targeting at poverty alleviation infrastructure. And that infrastructure, I can, I would like to also share with you that um, there is also a component of fisheries in irrigation systems. We've got those night storage dams. There's a lot of water in those night storage dams. And there is the opportunity for fisheries, for aquaculture. And um, we've got examples that we can actually share with uh, colleagues. Water transfers, um, there's, um, there are two major water transfers, one for Botswana, another one for Zimbabwe, hydropower production, we're talking of the Batoka Gorge, for which now the EIA is being, co um, is being uh, concluded. Then also transboundary irrigation schemes, they are all on the, on the cards. So these are key opportunities for sustainable development within the water course. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, what also binds the people, uh, the, I would say the people within the Zambes water course, they actually, during the development of the, um, of the strategic plan, they agreed on a vision with respect to where they want to be taken to by development, the preferred future. It reads as maximize the economic benefits of water development in the Zambezo water course subject to constraints of ensuring the maintenance of moderate environmental flows and flood protection. So this is the development future that was preferred and which is now the vision of development for all the people in the Zambezi watercourse. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, um, I'll now move on to the strategic plan for the Zambezi watercourse as a main instrument of cooperation for all the eight countries in the Zambezi water course. And this is now the new framework of um, planning and operations for the Zambezi water course. And it's the one through, well, that is actually going to be driving development through which development is going to be driven, you know, for the Zambezi water course. And in the agreement of 2004, the development of the strategic plan was actually made a priority. And it was divine, de, uh, defined as a development plan comprising a general planning tool. The general planning tool, we've got a decision support system that we actually developed, um, which is in place and which was developed through a multi-sectoral um, uh, consultative process. Which, is, uh, which was agreed on as the tool that will be used for the Zambezi in planning by all the eight countries. And there's also an inherent process for the identification, categorization, and prioritization of projects and programs for the efficient management and sustainable development of the Zambezi water course. And inherent to this process, of identification, categorization, and prioritization, there is uh, what we call, there's another instrument of cooperation, which is entitled the ZAMCOM Procedures for Notification of Planned Measures. And what this does is that uh, if a country wants to develop a project in any of its, um, any of its um, territory, it has to notify other countries so that you know there's no harm, which is uh, which will okay to other countries by way of developing that particular um, asset. And in this case, we can also relate it to fisheries. With fish, they like water, 
of a certain quality, water of a certain quantity for them to thrive, you know, to breed. So all of those have got to be maintained. And the strategic plan contributes to the contribution contributes to the mission of ZAMCOM, which is to promote the equitable and reasonable utilization of water resources of the Zambez Water Course Commission, water course, as well as um, sustainable development thereof. And next slide, please. Um, this is just um, um, strategic plan, the objective. Uh, what I could just say is um, um, it provides a basis for an agreed uh, coordinated and integrated implementation of activities in the context of efficient management and sustainable. And what I can also with respect to, to share with you on the last statement is that having adopted the strategic plan, member states are now required to conduct their management and development plans, projects and programs relating to the Zambezi water course in accordance with the strategic plan. Next slide, please. The core components of the strategic plan are infrastructure investment, livelihood support, environmental protection, and water resources management. Those are the key pillars of the strategic plan. So all the investments are going to be coming through those particular um, uh, pillars. Next slide, please. Yes. And you may also want to know that, you know, the preparation of the strategic plan, which is now the main um, planning and operations framework, um, is based on the previous, on the studies, quite a lot of studies that have gone on, you know, in the Zambezi. And then also the second bullet, it talks to the strong multi-sectoral uh, stakeholder consultation process that actually goes on for all the activities in the Zambez water course. Next slide, please. Um, so for the Zambez, uh, for the strategic plan to be implemented, what happened was uh, the strategic plan was deliberately developed without an implementation plan. So a number of activities had to be done before the actual implementation of the strategic plan. Um, so a number of activities have been prioritized under each of those pillars. The one that I would like to mention that I would like to share with you is one that we are actually implementing right away um, in cooperation with the WWF and with assistance from the United States, um, USAID and the, the United States Department of State. And this is actually focusing on dialogues so that, you know, people, you know, stakeholders, let's say from Angola where Portuguese speaking, from Namibia where English speaking, from um, Mozambique were also, uh, Portuguese speaking, you know, from the whole spectrum, from the upstream to the downstream to the mouth of the um, of the Zambezi, they should be able to talk to address issues pertaining to um, transboundary development. So there is a program that is actually working on the dialogue, um, how people can actually um, talk to each other about issues pertaining to the transboundary uh, system, which is the Zambezi. And um, that's just one that I want to share with you. Next slide, please. Yes, foreseen benefits of cooperation. Um, the management and development of the Zambezi is actually a cooperative activity. And these are some of the uh, um, benefits that were actually articulated by through um, multi-sectoral um, stakeholder consultations, peace dividends, 
increase the food security, increase the regional economic benefits, increase the energy security, joint investment planning, jointly addressing external threats, increased employment opportunities. These are key drivers, you know, that make people, um, that make the countries and ultimately the people cooperate. And at the bottom, you can see um, there is um, that bar with the A, with the flags of the eight countries. And then you've got Danida, you've got World Bank, the British flag, and some GIZ. What that symbolizes is with the eight countries, we need part, um, partnership, international cooperating partners, uh, strategic uh, partner organizations. And that is the way we are operating in the Zambezi. Um, that is essential for multi, multi sectoral management of uh, you know large rivers and um lastly thank you that is a picture of the um victoria falls very important for um for tourism thank you muchas gracias señor keseke muy interesante Thank you very much, Mr. Kaseki. That was extremely interesting and truly relevant. Last speaker on my list is Mr. Nelson Alex Dahua Machoa from the Quechua Peoples and an NGO of Ecuador. Mr. Dawa has extensive experience as a researcher and is currently the director of the of a division of the Agriculture Ministry of Ecuador. He represents the stakeholders on the ground. He will be addressing the issue of how indigenous peoples draw a link between the environment and human well being, and how this is reflected in their customs and traditions. We'll also be addressing the importance of forests, rivers, and fisheries for indigenous peoples as a main topic for his presentation. You have the floor. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this event. I'm part of this broader picture we've painted, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about the customs and traditions of indigenous peoples from the Pastasa watershed. And I'd like to share with you the experiences of our people. It's important to understand how indigenous peoples live, which is why I've tried to summarize a few key aspects. I'd like to tell you about how we live and why our worldview as indigenous peoples includes the importance of forests, rivers, fisheries in our daily lives. In the province of Pastasa, as you can see, it's quite a large area, a very diverse region of Ecuador with seven different nationalities, including Shuar, Chuar, Warani, Quechua, Chuar, Andu, and Sapara. And they're distributed across different areas, as you can see in the image up on the screen, which is a map of the different nationalities. Within these, many generations have 
live their lives and exercise their customs with a view to keeping forests alive in each of their individual territories. That's key in order to achieve sustainable development across all nationalities and peoples. As a people and as nationalities, we have dwelt in four main aspects. One of the elements is called biodiversity. You know that biodiversity is included in many aspects or components that are a part of it uh, in our own language in our cosmo vision we have guidelines and it is important that this has prevailed throughout the life of our communities. Our culture has also been important as each of the communities has developed its own culture. For millions of years, how they have carried out work in each of their communities. And then the element of history is also an important pillar in each of our communities because The history of each of our communities is developed according to how they have transformed and experienced their spirituality with their relationship with forests, between forests and mankind and men and women in the communities. And another thing is living together, shared lives sharing between uh, brothers, uh, people's communities, our experiences, our everyday life, to have conversations, uh, to become familiar, to solve problems amongst family members. That is why our shared lives together within our nationalities has been so important. Here you see grandmother Rebecca who has great knowledge of her own culture and she has handed it down by narrating the life of the different nationalities. One of the examples of our community can be told through the stories, the narrative. Sayaks are those who have left the higher basin of Pastaza to the lower basin towards Marañón and they have named the rivers because the Tayaks have been powerful. They take ayahuasca or other medicinal remedies based on their tradition, uh, the tradition of their spirituality in uh, terms of naming the rivers. So they are a, like small scientists because they, through their vision, have seen the development of the rivers, where they come from, how to name them. And all of this has been important from Pastaza all the way downstream. Another of the historical issues that are told by our grandparents, the Amasangas, our ancestors, they're the kings of the jungle. They have the energy, they own the forest and they attract the animals. Of many species. In a primary intangible forest where not just anyone can enter, not just any human being can carry out uh, 
his or her activities there. And the Amazangas are the owners. So they have a territory that is reserved only to them. Nobody else can enter it because that is where the spiritual conversations with the Lord take place. And only through them can you carry out work or activities there. The Huri Huris is a, a similar story, millenary story, history of the indigenous peoples in the Pastaza people. And the Ingaros also, they have a very marked uh, spirituality they have maintained for thousands of years in many of the communities, uh, transforming it into an experienced uh, spirituality, living in the jungle. And they keep the jungle alive. That is why the relationship with rivers and forests uh, has always uh, been important in the stories that are handed down generation from generation. The culture here in Pastaza has been varied. Since we have seven nationalities, uh, different peoples and communities have their own customs and traditions. And uh, for example, we have uh, dances and the dances are different amongst the nationalities, uh, painting. Painting our bodies has uh, different meanings in the different communities. As you can see in this image through the blowgun, uh, this man is being painted uh, and then uh, they wear ornaments and they know how to preserve uh, the forest in its natural habitat and uh, the different uh, practices of yachak. Here our grandmother is blowing so that the evil spirits can leave to free this man who was linked to evil spirits and he needs to be liberated from them. That is important in each of our nationalities and that is how they have lived and produced many yachaks that have been handed down generation from generation. And it has been important uh, to strengthen this in the daily lives uh, of each of these communities. And then they also have costumes. Uh, what they, the ornaments they wear have been important in their daily lives. They have uh, different types of clothing that has meaning from the ancestors, from the grand uh, parents. Uh, and ethnobiology has focused on the nationalities as these know many of the species in their own languages that they apply in their daily lives. They use them in their daily lives and it has been very important. They support many of the communities and uh, the ones that are nearby along the highways where mining activities are carried out have been partially lost because uh, in the area of the highways, those who carry out uh, forestry activities uh, have invaded the area and the community needs to survive with its own harmony. And they try to maintain their own language, but more and more they are starting to speak in Spanish and English and their children and young people are learning English and Spanish and the traditional languages in the high basin of Pastaza is now being partially lost. Another important aspect has been sharing our lives and 
our agricultural activities in the Pastaza province of the Amazon area. As you can see, they share, they make chicha, which is chewed by the women, and everyone takes part in the cooking, the children, the girls, the mothers, they prepare this. And that has been our tradition, sharing between families, between brothers, between communities, because that is how certain experiences of ancient knowledge of uh, seed keeping are handed down and communicated. Each of the communities has uh, ancestral seeds that they have kept for many, many centuries. And it is important for the territory because the communities, they have not devoted themselves to agriculture in a large territorial extension. Only half a hectare, for example, of land is what each community cultivated, but there is a lot of diversity in the agricultural uh, systems, uh, both for the extraction of uh, wood or uh, other crops of uh, plants uh, that are endemic in the area. However, some communities are beginning to lose this uh, tradition. And then there's also a tradition of textiles with mokawas. You see that this woman is weaving a mokawa, representing many of those textile products represent the animals. That are important from the spiritual standpoint. And through the preparation of the mokawa, they produce also the chicha. And that is why it has been important to safeguard this in all the communities. You see the child holding a squirrel because we live together with our animals. So the child knows and lives together with the fauna. That is how our communities live with the animals, and that is what has kept our culture alive. The ecosystem is alive, it is intact. Human beings have not caused a huge impact on our territory because of this, because we live in harmony with nature. That is how we share our lives together. And also basket weaving. The community itself knows how, how to weave. What you see here is a bejuco, that is the basket that is made by men in many shapes for different activities. As you can see here, for agriculture to carry out uh, uh, bananas, pineapples, uh, sugar cane, and that is important for each of the communities. So ancestral knowledge is important because uh, the ancestors, uh, the grandparents, grand, uh, handed down the traditions, but now we are losing this uh, in part because multinational companies, mining and oil companies uh, have uh, taken over the land and that is where when the communities have not supported one another, all of their traditions have been lost. And here you can see our fishing activities. We've also had important uh, relations in the communities within a people. Each nationality has its own techniques or practices that they develop for fishing to carry out different activities. They know many species in their own languages, roughly 277 species are the ones that we know in our own languages and it would be good to compare the names of the species amongst our 
communities? What are the scientific names of the species that we know? We haven't really looked into this. Uh, we haven't explored the flora and fauna uh, from the etiology standpoint, but we have so many species and as nationalities, we have uh, a small community system where dynamite explosions are prohibited. We can eat the products for our own food security, but not beyond that. And that is why sharing our experiences has been so important in order to carry out conservation of many of the resources that our communities are now losing so that the coming generations will be able to see the species that, that still exist in our communities. That is why when it comes to hunting, it is important. Hambi is a poison developed by men and it requires a lot of time to make it uh, using uh, techniques uh, and medicinal plants. And Hambi is a poison that can kill an animal. Uh, you can also hunt uh, with blow guns, uh, spears. The tip of the spear is uh, dipped into the poison and that kills the animal. And it is uh, cheap because they can develop their own livelihoods and within their own communities, how they live their lives in order to have food security. And then we have the bodoqueras, the blowguns, then spears, hooks, arrows, also used for fishing. And this has been important for all the different communities and nationalities. Medicinal plants, ancestral medicinal plants that our communities have are also extremely important because many of the communities have used them since ancient times and the forests are essential because it is from the forests that some animals or aquatic species are caught and used so that these species are used for together with plants to make medicinal remedies. And in many communities, these traditional practices are still uh, applied uh, to the making of medicinal plants. There are many different species that are known in the nationality's own languages and uh, being a part of this exploration that we're carrying out uh, some of us don't know them while our grandparents do know them and it is important for them to hand them down to convey them to the future generations as a conclusion we have seven different nationalities in the area and we conservation such as runa yachaya explore with the, the indigenous cosmovision that our nationalities have in this province. And we have also recommended the governance to be independent through the indigenous cosmovision, our world, vision of the world to reach sustainable development because each of the territories maintains its uh, vision of the world and manage the resources. It is important so that multinational companies, uh, to prevent multinational companies from affecting our communities and causing them to lose their customs, their traditions and culture. 
we also have ancestral and Western knowledge. It is important nowadays uh, to know about other cultures because we are globalized. Globalization is moving forward and so it is important to have knowledge of the reality of the world and what is happening with climate change now. This is what I can tell you about our experience and I'm here to answer any questions should you wish to make any. Thank you very much, Mr. Dehua. This was a very inspiring and important presentation. And I'm very grateful that we have your perspective as part of our program today. So with thanks to all our speakers, I'm proud and happy to introduce the director of FAO's forestry division, Meta Wilkie, for closing comments. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And first and foremost, thank you so, so much to the speakers for this series of fascinating presentations. With perspectives from around the globe, we see that in spite of the challenges, there's a lot of value in intersectoral collaboration across ecosystems. I'd also like to sincerely thank the audience for your comments, your questions, your enthusiasm. We are all benefiting from the very active discussion in the chat, and I hope that all the panelists will have time to answer some of your questions and that this discussion will continue into the future. The evidence that we've heard today demonstrate the possibility, but also the difficulty of implementing integrated approaches to achieve socially, economically, and ecologically balanced development across large and very complex watersheds in order to deliver on the sustainable development goals. But it's not only necessary to think about, think across disciplines and come up with innovative solutions. It's equally important to ensure broad participation of stakeholders, as we've heard. And this can help make the true value of ecosystems services visible, can help to better inform management and the trade-offs, and can help sustain ecosystem services to benefit human society. Broad participation of stakeholders can also help a balanced and sustainable development and an equitable distribution of the benefits. Many of the most successful strategies prioritize co-management with local communities using their extensive local knowledge that we've just heard of ecosystem functions, biodiversity, and priorities for effective restoration measures. FAO is just developing a new strategic framework with four outcomes, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life. That framework is well suited to try to address these issues and help countries meet in particularly the Sustainable Development Goal 14, Life Below Water, and Sustainable Development Goal 15, Life on Land. And as we've seen today, the management of freshwater systems is inherently multidisciplinary. FAO initiatives for multidisciplinary work has catalyzed this joint forestry and fisheries event. And we anticipate additional joint activities supported by what we call the Multidisciplinary Fund in Zambia, Colombia, and Papua New Guinea. Manuel Barange at the beginning spoke about the importance of forest for fish. So I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of fish for forests. Inland fisheries provide food and livelihoods to riparian communities who are then better able to manage their forest resources sustainably. Inland fish may also supply the nutrients that feed the forest itself. Pacific salmon transport nutrients hundreds of kilometers from the ocean to the forested streams where they spawn and die. Nutrients from the fish are transferred to forest soils where they support the growth of trees. Similarly, the Cayman of the Amazon River feeding in productive lagoons and then moving to less productive areas, fertilized floodplain forests. And across many tropical rivers, fruit eating fish promote forest diversity by selectively dispersing seeds of fruit trees within their river networks. So in these systems, fish are even the potential engines of forest restoration. The 
absolutely fantastic biodiversity represented by inland fisheries contributes to the overall health of forested systems. Many groups consider fisheries and biodiversity conservation to be competing objectives, but experiences show that inland fisheries and biodiversity conservation are mutually supportive. And all the examples of inland fisheries restoration explored to date have demonstrated significant co-benefits of improved biodiversity. Local communities exhibiting a high degree of knowledge and awareness of both the aquatic and terrestrial biodiversity, and in particular their interdependencies, are motivated to sustain the fish, the forest, and the linkages essential to them both. I also want to talk to you a little bit about the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which runs from this year, 2021 to 2030. It is co-led by FAO and the United Nations Environment Program. It's a rallying call for the protection and revival of ecosystems, all types of ecosystems all around the world for the benefit of people and nature. As we've heard today, freshwater ecosystems are essential elements of all landscape scale restoration plans. And the decade on ecosystem restoration is an opportunity to bring together multiple existing data and knowledge stream within FAO and between FAO and other organizations, including data on fisheries, agriculture, forestry, water resources. And effective work we're hoping will also help utilize FAO's considerable knowledge base, knowledge that's spread across our divisions on sustainable inland fisheries, on sustainable forest management, sustainable land management, landscape restoration, integrated water resources management. So do reach out to us if you want some more information about what we are doing in those areas of work. I also want to say that this decade on, on the ecosystem restoration provides a particular opportunity to make the goods and services provided by freshwater ecosystem more visible in policy arenas. And I would encourage you all to take advantage of that. The value of these ecosystems is often not fully recognized and therefore may be given low priority in basin development strategies. So they will benefit from increased awareness, which can be generated through this decade. And those awareness in particularly of the far reaching impacts of land and water use across watersheds and of the need for an integrated approach to management. So I hope you will be active participants in this UN decade. We will have a formal launch of the decade on the 5th of June on World Environment Day. And I know there's a lot of activities planned in connections with that as well. With that, I'd like to thank all our speakers, all our participants, those who are up very early and those who are up very late for your participation and for your enthusiasm. And as we are getting closer to the afternoon here in Rome, we wish our colleagues who are observing Ramadan a very joyful Eid al Fitr celebration tomorrow. Thank you all very much for this event. Bye for now.